Hello, church. Happy Easter. So good to see you today. You may be seated. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We have people that are out in the lobby, I understand. Welcome all of you in the lobby that's sitting there. I just went and greeted people in the prayer chapel over here. We have people over there, so hello to you. I just said hello to you over there. And so we have a lot of people coming. And here's what we need to do. We need to, every Sunday, have people in the lobby, have people, is anybody here? Is anybody in the lobby? <laughs> and in, we need, we need to fill up every part of this building. And every room, we, we'll put a TV set in it, and you'll be able to watch it, but you know what? This is where you're gonna hear the word of God. The anointing of God is gonna break things out of your life. God is gonna be real to you. It's not just gonna be a sermon, it's gonna be a lifestyle. Come on, you're in a powerful place right here. You really are. I know that. The two, you're alive. This is alive here. And you know what? Those of you that are out in the lobby and those of you in the prayer chapel, y'all clap. Y'all get excited because everybody in here is excited. We are a very expressive church. We let people know when we like something and cheer something. If we mention Jesus, we go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, very good. Pastor Mike is over, and uh, I think he did five services, six services, and he has uh, he has throat issues, so uh, he's a, a he man there. So yeah, he, he's he's doing great over there, and they're they're doing that. And so Debbie and Debbie got to come with me this time. Debbie's here, and and uh, our prayer warrior, and she got, she was praying. She set up our prayer team, and she was uh, part of my miracle, of course, in her prayer team. And uh, Debbie and I, hey, I don't know if you knew this, but in, in August, August 24, we would have been married. We would have been like, I don't know if we'll make it, but we will be married. <laughs> we could make it. I don't know. Pray for us. It would be, I, I, there, I'm, I'm preaching. Don't, don't talk to me when we're preaching. We'll talk later, okay? I'm doing, I'm doing a message now. We'll talk later. Okay, and so we may make it to, no. It will be 50 years that Debbie and I have been, 50 years, 50 years. Isn't that amazing? I'm not going to say anything. I'm, I'm so, thing, so many things going through. Has anybody here uh, been married 50 years or longer? Let me see where you're at if you've been married 50 years or longer. Anybody stand to your feet if, you, if you're able to. Over here, good for you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody balcony outside? Okay. Uh, most don't make it two years, but so we made it, <laughs> made it 50. Um, let me get going. This has been a, a pretty incredible Easter because uh, we did Saturday night, we had, it was over a hundred and some people that were saved Saturday night here. Uh, the whole altar was full at the last service. Amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Thank God for. And as you know, I've been on my journey here to, I think some of you that's been over the years have seen that, okay, I'm getting a little bit better. I'm getting a little bit better, getting a little bit better. You know, I'm able to think a little better. Uh, before, when I would, in, in years ago and things like that, I, I would, you didn't know it, I looked uh, fine, but I'm looking out and everybody's blurred, it's a blurred vision, I had my equilibrium, I'm dizzy, but I just, I said, if I'm still breathing, apparently I'm supposed to do something for God and not sit in a chair. So I pushed myself to go and do it, and uh, my greatest thrill is doing what I do, but more than that is to see people at an altar which I didn't know if I would see that again for a period of time because some of you that's had prolonged sickness and things, I understand it. And uh, you wonder if you're ever going to be back where you are, what you're called to do. And um, just, just this step by step. And, of course, I've got a praying wife, and I've got a wife that kind of takes care and come on, take this. I may have a wife that has just a box of pills and constantly take this, take this, and you don't know if you're taking rat poisoning or what. You know, just... Um, I'll just take it. I Okay. <laughs> so she has been, been wonderful in doing that. Um, 
Uh, this Easter here is something where I'm glad you're here. Uh, it doesn't matter if you've been here for years and years and years. Debbie and I have been here for over 30 years. And, uh, or this is your first time. I'm glad you're here. And uh, you're very welcome here. And I think, if anything, if you're an intelligent person, you want to learn about what all this uh, hurrah is about Easter. I think we know limited, a, a limited amount in the sense of Good Friday, Jesus died. And uh, maybe we don't know the, you know the story behind it and the story after it. But then we know three days, three nights, and then we, we have Sunday, he rose from the dead. And we know that's Easter. And so you preach messages on Easter and how he rose from the dead. Up from the grave he arose. And so we do the songs. Thank you. And, um, and uh, I wanted to, to help you understand, and this might be uh, the most vivid, because I'm going to demonstrate, I'm going to illustrate a message. It's the first time I've done any illustration in years because of physically I just didn't feel strong enough to be able to do that. I just had strong enough to just stand right here. But I'm, I'm going to do this. This is the third one for me this weekend, so I'm feeling pretty good. I'm doing, I'm doing better. Now, some of you don't know what happened. I'll explain to that later. But I, I, I honestly, I said, God, show me something that will help us understand how we're in the mess that we're in right now, uh, what's going on in our world, how did we get here, what really happened, why did Jesus have to come, what's the cross really mean, what happened in the supernatural unseen world with all of this. I'm going to help explain that to you, and I'm going to share with you. Now, when you come to this church, you've got to understand we are not culturally correct in things. We are biblically correct in things. So it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter I'm into this, I'm into this, and maybe as different as it is, you're welcome here. It doesn't matter what you believe or what you kind of worship. You come here. We'd love for you to come here. Now, when you come here, you may hear things that you disagree with. Now, understand when you disagree with it, you're not disagreeing with the preacher you're disagreeing with the Word of God. Because we're not going to preach opinion here. We're going to preach the Word of God. And so when you hear us talk and us share, I'm not sharing what I think. My words don't have much power, but God's words can create a world. You know what I'm saying? So words, were, words are for creation. Is That's the way God used words in Genesis was for creation. He created things by speaking. So you'll be at a church that will tell you the truth. May not feel good, but that's okay. A lot of things we were raised as a kid didn't feel good that our parents did, but it helped us. It made us kind of become a man or become a woman, whatever, you know, and, and it made us stronger. So I just want you to know is that nobody is against anything that you hear or where there's some ax to grind. We're just going to preach the Word of God, the Word that Jesus, as we know on Easter, is that He died on Friday and He rose from the dead on Sunday. What is that all about? So I've simply titled this. It might not be the, the most interesting title, but it's one of the most powerful words in the human language, and the word is redemption. I'm going to talk to you about this, this word that you heard and have heard of redemption and what that means. And what it basically means is to repurchase. It's to repurchase something, meaning this, is that we were in God's graces at one time, but somebody or something or some way we had to be repurchased. It's a recovery from something that has been pawned. You and I, since Adam and Eve, since the sin in the garden, we have been in Satan's pawn shop as the most expensive item. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price to get us out or let me just use the word, redeemed us, repurchased us, brought us out of that, saved us out of the situation we're in. We could not get out of our sin. You can't get out of the pawn shop yourself. You need someone, only one, Jesus, to get you out of this. Now, so we'll talk about redemption, and I'm going to share with you the whole story of what happened in the garden all the way to Revelation, and you're going to have probably the clearest picture you'll ever have of the Bible, how it all works, what this is all about. 
Stay with me. Father, in Jesus' name, this is a day of change in hundreds of people's lives. There will be many in this church that will walk down to this altar in Jesus' name, and their lives will totally become brand new, and they'll begin living their best life because you now are part of it. I thank you, Lord, for the healing and the miracles you've done in my life and that I've been able to pray for others to receive the same. Today, I have an assignment. Today, I have an assignment to help the body of Christ, to help every individual that has ears to hear and hear my voice right now. And those that are on the airways and watching for wherever they're at in the world, I pray that, God, that you will speak to the hearts of people. I don't care to tickle the mind, Father. I want to massage the heart and heal the heart today. Touch me. Take my old frail earthen vessel of mere clay. Speak truth and speak power through me, Lord, because I can't do it on my own. I can't do anything on my own without you. I need you today. Help me now in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen? amen. Okay, good, church. Now, you can shout, you can clap, you can do what you want, because this is the most exciting church there is. Honestly, the best church I've ever preached at in the world is right here at the House Modesto. I am very serious about that. I love you. Debbie and I, you are family. You will always be our family. You're always going to be the best and your most exciting people in the world. Okay. So let me read to you and start the story in Ephesians 4. Let me, let me just share some things that was going on. The scriptures say, this is why the scriptures say, when he, talking about Jesus, ascended, ascended means, one, one meaning would be to go in the air, is what he did. You ascended to the heights, to heaven. He led a crowd of captives, you and I, and gave us, gave gifts to his people. Now, verse 9. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended into the lowly world, which is hell. So, Pastor Glenn, you mean you tell me that Jesus went to hell? That's what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you that. The Word is telling you that. Jesus went to hell. So, let me help you understand. On the cross, Friday, Jesus died. You said, well, they put him in a tomb. They put, might have put him in a tomb, but he left the tomb. In other words, they didn't check on him for three days, three nights. During that time they put him in a tomb, he went straight to hell. Because he descended before he went. He went down before he went up. You have to go down before you go up. you got to break your pride, break your selfishness, break your jealousy. You're going to have to break down your flesh before you're going to go up. Okay, I don't have time for that. That, that. So he said, notice he ascended in verse 9. This clearly means Christ also descended. Verse 10. And the same one who descended, Jesus is the one who ascended higher than all of heaven so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Okay, let me build on that thought so I'll give you some more scripture. Let's look at Matthew 12. It says, as Jonah, now this is in reference to, it's referring to what happened with Jonah, happened with Jesus. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will, wow, it does say Jesus, the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, which is going to be hell, for three days and three nights. So the, does that not back it up? Yes, it backs it up. So when Jesus died on Friday, he went to hell. What happened in hell, Pastor? I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to show you what happened and what he did. Now, you and I, it's obvious, we know that we're in a war. You and I have been called to war. The Bible actually illustrates the fact that the weaponry that we have are like helmets and sores and breastplates and so forth, things like this, that we are in a war. There's a fight, as you know, I don't need to convince you, for your mind, for your soul, for your family. And the only way we can really understand the happenings of the cross and the resurrection is that we are part of a great cosmic conflict that uh, to demonstrate and vindicate the holiness of and the greatness of God, and to bring Him glory. What happened is thousands of years ago, Scripture tells us, Satan begins launching an attack in heaven. Earth is not here. Adam and Eve is not here. This is happening before the time there's an attack going on in heaven. And it was an attack on the throne room of God, and this was from Lucifer. 
Now, if you don't know, and I know we have new people, Lucifer, Satan, basically was the worship leader in heaven. He led the worship in heaven, and he had every instrument there was of sound, musical instruments, built in his body. He was a very unique angel and, uh, and had ability. Kind of like if you look at our song leader that we had, Haley, today, she has, she has authority in the sense of leading the worship in the church today, and then you have the pastor come up and so forth. Lucifer was the song leader in heaven, and this was his responsibility and what he did. So what happened is, is, is Satan wanted to go ahead and dethrone God. So God judged Satan, evicted him from the heavenly position that he was in, and says, you big boy, vacate the premises and get out now. Now, Satan's superpower, if you want to call it, is deception. Satan was able to deceive a third of the angels in heaven to go with him. Those angels are called demons. So a third of them went with him and so forth. So his gift is deception. Very good. Still doing it today. You and I still have the Satan that deceives us, and deception is always there. Understand something about angels. We hear so much about demons, we don't talk about angels much. Demons don't even have the same power as angels. One of the reasons is, is because demons are following Satan, and we have angels that are following God. And God out-trumps anything that Satan can do at any time. Matter of fact... In the book of Revelation, when Satan gets thrown to hell, God doesn't even throw him to hell. It's the archangel Michael that's going to whip his... Huh, 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 huh. No, huh. So you got to understand, Satan is not... I think sometimes we think, oh, Satan is so... Fun. Satan is not standing eyeball to eyeball with God. You understand? Satan created this punk. You know what I'm saying? He, he created him. There is no equal of power, and there's no, uh, who's going to win the tug of war? No, 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 no. All God's got to do, that's all he's got to do. He's all powerful. Earth is his footstool, the Bible says. Now look in Colossians 2. It says this, in a way, what God did, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities, and he shamed them. Give you another translation. He made a public spectacle. Okay, you remember we see these old movies and, and every time they, they tortured somebody or they killed somebody, they would bring them to the center of the, of the town and they, all the people had to come out and see, you know, the, the uh, discipline or the death of someone that did something there to teach them a lesson. And what they were making is a public spectacle. If you do this, okay, so God was not going to go ahead because he did this in heaven. God says, I'm going to shame him publicly. Now, here's the plan being laid out. You hear? By his victory over them on the cross. The cross is going to be a shame time, and it's going to be a defeat time, and it's going to be an utter wipeout that's going to take place. God wanted to not only beat Satan, wanted to humiliate him in front of the whole world and everyone. So God puts a plan together in motion when he created Adam and Eve. How did they come into it? This is God's plan. And they were going to rule over the earth. So Satan now has now been cast out of heaven. He's thrown down to earth now. He's not in heaven. Get out of here. Go to earth. So now earth is considered, let's just say, enemy territory. This is where he rules. This is his little place that he has. So God says, you know what? Uh, since he kind of did a, a number up here in heaven... I think I'm going to invade his territory, and I'm going to place a man there uh, on earth. And, and you know, because Satan has trashed this area. Anything that is trashed, probably the devil is involved with it. He tried to trash heaven, so now God's going to send you and I to trash Satan is what we're to do and give us the power to do that. So up until this point, the battle had only taken place in heaven. It wasn't an earthly battle. It was all in heaven. When he gets thrown out, and now he's on earth, he's here now, and then all of a sudden his plan is, I'm going to put Adam and Eve, I'm going to put them on earth, on Satan's place here, his planet here, 
and we're going to expand the battle from heaven, and I'm going to take the battle to him now on earth. So the war now between God and Satan includes the human race. Now, to understand the spiritual warfare, we got to set the stage of our first parents, Adam and Eve. we got to remember, God created the angels with the ability to choose. So Lucifer had the ability to choose. We don't want to follow you. Pride is one of the main issues of, of uh, you, you definitely don't want pride. That connects you with the devil in darkness. You don't want that. So, but he gave you and I, you had the ability to choose if you're going to come to church today. That was a choice. You made, you made a choice on, you were sitting out in line and say, you know, there's so many cars here, why don't we just go home? Nah, we're already here, let's stay. I know there's some of you, so you stay. You made a choice. It's one of the most powerful things that God has given to us is to be able to make a choice and the ability to choose. He doesn't want you and I to be forced to worship him. Lift your hands. No, I'm going to lift them for you. No, go ahead and say good thing. No. I do that because my heart is connected to him, and I want to do that. You don't want people forced to love you. God doesn't want that either. So he allows us to have a choice to worship him out of love, not out of necessity. So Lucifer, we know, rebels against God. And because the devil is the devil, wherever he goes, he's going to bring disaster, and he's going to bring darkness. Another word for darkness for you to understand is chaos. So if you have chaos right now in your family and in your life, you probably have some demons there in your house that are bringing chaos and trash. Because, let me, let me just read the Bible in Genesis 1 and help you explain. The earth was formless and empty. Well, that's because Satan is here. Your life is empty if you're following the devil. It's empty if you don't know God. It's empty. Darkness covered. Another word for darkness is chaos. If we turned off all the lights, we put a siren on, uh, leave the building, leave the building. We're running into each other. We're bouncing around, everybody's screaming because it's chaos, because it's darkness, total darkness was on the earth. So, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God says, let there be light. So all of a sudden, light comes on, and another word for light is order. So, church, listen to this. From the beginning of time, God has always given us the ability to bring order to chaos in our lives. It was established right here in the book of Genesis. If we get more of God, how many of you remember before you were saved and then now you're saved and realized you got a lot smarter? <laughs> you, you, you're doing things that are wiser in your life. So what he's saying is, let there be light. Let there be order. From now on, you have the ability to straighten things out in your life. You can bring order. So when God addresses the earth and he fills it now, he begins to fill it with creatures and, and divides the land and the water and shapes the mountains and makes the animals. Even Job, in Job 38, 7, it says the angels began to sing with joy because God was getting ready to do an extreme makeover of the devil's planet. Why? God just had an unbelievable plan to unfold. Here, I'm going to let you know, here's his plan. God was going to create a creature of lesser stature than the angels to demonstrate to all the universe that even though this creature, mankind, does not have angelic ability, does not have angelic powers, does not have angelic experience, if that lesser creature would just trust and obey God, he would be greater and go farther than any angel in heaven who refused to obey and trust God. And he's speaking to Satan and his fallen angels, his demons. He's saying this to him. The lesser creature that the Bible talks about is you and I. God is telling Satan, I can create a creature of less beauty than you, less ability than you, that if they trust and obey me, I will do more with that weaker creature than you can do with all your power and all your demons you have. And when Satan listened to this, I can just hear him just scream. So it says this in Genesis 1. 
It says, so God creates human beings in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them male and female. That can't be right. Is that right up there? I know I'm wearing glasses. Uh, in God created, God created, uh, not an influencer created, not a person on Facebook created, TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. God. And you know what? When God says something, he didn't have to go back and apologize. You know, I didn't realize in 2024 that we were going to maybe add a few things to it. I should have written it different. Who are you with your little 5% gray matter in your head going to decide something different than God has spoken? And why are we listening to you as if you are the creator of the universe? God said, I'm creating a male. And the reason for this is you're seeing next that you don't hear much. Go and put the scripture up. Nope. God created being in his own image. He created male and female. Now watch. He created them. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. If you can't be fruitful and multiply, it's not of God. It's just not of God. Or you're against a bunch of people. I'm not against anything. I'm just reading the Word of God. If you have a problem, you're going to shake your fist at God, and I warn you not to. And then you're going to fill the earth. You're going to be in charge. You're going to be the governor. You're going to reign over everything. The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the animals that scurry along the ground. I'm putting man, a lesser creature, in charge of your house. He's in full control, Satan. He will have dominion over you. He's the boss now of earth. Well, that explains, right? That explains why the serpent came and tempted Eve to doubt God. Why? Because Satan wanted his planet back. No, no, I, 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 don't, I don't want this to happen. He despised the power of God. He despised everything to God. You know that. So guess what is in the process, what's going on right here? Through his church and through his people. He is wanting us to take this planet back. He wants us to take our city back from Satan. He wants us to take our neighborhoods back. It was not for Satan to rule in our country. It's not for Satan to rule in our city. And it says it right here in the garden. I'm changing that. I'm a choose people that's going to stand up for me. And the anointing of God is going to be on their lives. And we're going to see lives change and come back to God. Come on, somebody help me preach. So, God created the angels. He created Lucifer, Satan. He created him. And he created them, as you know, in heaven with the ability to choose. The angels had a choice. We know they had a choice because Lucifer was able to talk a third of them and deceive them. So Adam and Eve and you and I are created with a choice. Just like it was in heaven. We choose whether to love and obey God or disobey God. We choose that. Now to make this choice real, follow this. God plants trees in the garden. He planted some trees so they could have a choice. So we read in Genesis 2, 9. It says, the Lord then made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground and trees that were beautiful, that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed two trees. One was a tree of life and one was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. So there are two trees that he puts in the garden there. And then he gives instructions about the trees. He's very clear. And he says this in the next verses. Just put the next one up there. That's all I got. 16 and 17. Right? But the Lord God now warns them. So you got to understand, you can't just do everything you want to do. You do have to be obedient. You may clearly eat the fruit of every tree in the garden. 
Good deal. Whole gardens, uh, everything, uh, things to eat all over. Except the tree, but of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of it, you're going to die. Spiritually die. Separated from God, you die when you're separated from God. Now, how many of you understand what just happened? If I went ahead and put 10 doors on the stage, I have 10 doors on the stage, and I said, I've got something behind each door. You can open up all these doors here except this one. Which one do you want to open? We want to open the one we can't and we're told we can't do. And this is kind of that nature, the devil's, that's the Lord nature of the devil. God tells you something, don't do this, and that's the first thing where our mind goes. Well, I want to know why. I want to know why that's so. So we have these trees, as you see, behind me. We have these trees. So he placed perfect creatures, Adam and Eve, into a perfect environment with everything they needed and it's exactly what heaven had. Everything was perfect with everything you had and you make the wrong choice. So God says, I need to make sure they want to follow me and not be deceived. So he puts the two trees in the garden. And so we have two trees. We have the, the tree of life. The tree of life means it's God's Word. I believe what God says. Whatever God says, I agree with. I don't have to understand what God says, but if God said it, I trust Him more than I trust my little brain to make up an idea of what I think He means. If He says it, He's very clear, don't do this, don't do that, then I'm going to trust that. If He says this is wrong, I don't need to understand, I don't need to listen to some pea brain over here try to explain to me that no, He's not right. If God said it, this is what I'm eating of, I'm eating of this tree. But there's another tree that you have, and that's called the tree of opinion. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil means you can make up your own mind. You can choose what you want to choose. So we can say, well, we don't believe in abortion here, God doesn't want to do that then this tree says, abortion is fine, let's vote for that, and let's go ahead and kill babies. Okay, now, they're, they're not doing that. Abortion doctors are not trying to abort babies to make Christians mad. They're doing it because they honestly believe that they're helping women. We have people in our church that have had abortions in their past life. God has forgiven that. If they did it again today, they wouldn't do it because they're eating from a different tree. We don't, you know, our, our problem is very simple. We have a tree problem in our world. It started in the garden. You want to keep your opinion over here. You want to believe what you want to believe over here. You want to do what you want to do over here. This is what you want to do. President Joe Biden. I read, changed Easter to transgender day of visibility. Now, Joe, I know you're watching. No joke. And if you're not watching, God sent an angel to wake him up and turn on the TV. But Joe, let me tell you something. You messed up, big boy. You crossed the line. And there's a thousands and millions of people around the world where you crossed the line going and removing Easter with a holiday. I'm, I'm not even upset with the transgender community. You know what? It wasn't them that forced that to be a holiday. You can celebrate any time you want to and say, oh, this is our day, we're going to do this. I'm not upset with them. I'm upset with taking Easter and trying to translate it into some other holiday when it's always been Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus is alive today and it always will be that Joe and you need to understand that the church is not going to put up with that kind of foolishness no 
No, we're not going to put up with it. I couldn't do that the other services because I needed it for this service, okay? Yeah, it's going down, going down. You're going down, going down, going down, going down, going down. Hey, 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 let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. This isn't, this isn't built to hold me. Racism. Racism. It keeps coming up in our country. It's this tree. It's an opinion. There's no racism in this tree. God doesn't have any racism. No, no, no. He doesn't have anything at all. Matter, matter of fact, when Jesus came, when Jesus came, when Jesus came, um, the Jews were separated, Samaritans and Gentiles, and they hated each other. And Jesus broke through all of that. You got to understand, it, it, Jesus was totally against, you think you're better than somebody else. He said, I'm going to go heal I'm not just going to heal the Jews. I'm going to heal everybody. I don't care who you are. Now watch this. Watch this. Let me let me explain this to you. What happens is racism. Gee, it wasn't it wasn't in this this right here. It's not from God. It's from people. People decide somebody's better than somebody else, or somebody needs to do this. This is people did this. This is your opinion of what you think. You know, I have some, I have some uh, good friends that are black bishops in the church. I've got a lot of friends, all different backgrounds. Some of you better look at, I may throw this right here. But you, you fall asleep, I'm looking for you right now. Uh, so, I asked the bishops, one of them said to me one time, very interesting, he goes, Pastor Glenn, do you know Adam was black? I, I, you know, I never really thought about it a whole lot. I said, what do you mean? He said, he's made from dirt. You know, I, you thought, sounds right, you know, like if he was made from dirt. And then I found it interesting in the sense that I looked up, if, how many know we're made from dirt? We're really dirt. How can you be so prideful and cocky when you're just made of dirt? I mean, you're not, you know what I'm saying? You know what happens? And if you don't bathe, dirt starts stinking. You stink, just like dirt, okay? You understand? And so we're made from dirt. And what happens when you die? You, you go back to dirt. So the only thing precious in us right now is the presence of God. Because all we are is dirt without Him. Once He leaves... Okay, wait, wait, I'm not the... Not the okay, so... So I, asked, I said, okay, God just drops it in my I never saw anybody do this. I said, God, if we're made out of dirt, I wonder how many colors of dirt are on the earth. Found it interesting. You know, you're thinking, okay, dirt's just, we know what dirt looks like and so forth. We know what sand looks or whatever. And so I said, I wonder what kind of dirt. I looked it up, and this was the picture that came up right here. Every color of every human being is in this picture right here. Adam was born with every color in his body, and they're all one. Man comes from man, we all come from one couple, and that is our mom and dad, and all the colors that we see in the world are there. Do you see a color that's better than another? No! That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what the devil wants you to believe. Thank God we have churches where we have people that love each other and stuff. I, I don't know about you, but I don't look at a color. I look at a heart of somebody, and I, can, I am best friends with everybody. I would give you my heart. I would give you my eyes. I would give you what I need. I don't care what color you are. That makes no difference in me to go and make a decision like that. You're eating from the tree of the world is what you're doing. I'll tell you one more stupid story. Uh, this is stupider than you've ever can imagine. New York City just voted. Five said no, two said yes. Voting on if an ele elephant is a human being. Five said 
know that he has to stay in the in the zoo two said yes what I would do is go get Dumbo and I would bring that elephant and I said here's your house pet let's just see how it goes right now and pull that elephant in that house and if you think that's a human what I'm saying is when you eat of this tree that God says don't eat of your mind will come up with the craziest wildest things to see when I look sometimes on it and I see a, a man dressed up with a dress on with a wig with makeup with lipstick and he's preaching from the Bible in the word that Jesus died for I don't get mad I feel sorry that they're eating from a different tree that I'm eating of I'm not eating for what I feel I'm eating from what I know and what I know is the Word of God is true come on somebody you know what I'm talking about So the story here, the story here is in Genesis 3. God takes innocent, an innocent couple, newly married, honeymoon in the garden. Where do you want to go, honey? I guess the garden. That's the only place they had. <laughs> no cruises were going. Ready to serve God. They're ready to serve God. And they're ready to rule over Satan's planet. So listen, Satan had to make his move. He had to do something. Now you understand why he's involved. Why? Because Adam and Eve, if they made the right choice and only ate of the tree of life, then they would live forever and never die. The battle would be over. Victory of ruling the earth is done. It's all over with. Time and everything is done. And Satan would be no more. It's over with. He's done. So Satan had to do something about this. So he goes to Eve. And why did he go to Eve? I know you really want this answer, don't y'all? Why did he go to Eve? Because man is the authority and woman is influence. She's influential. Another way you can say this is man is the head and woman is the neck that turns the head. Isn't that right, Debbie? Yeah, I guess so. So we begin reading here in Genesis 3, 1. Watch this. Now it's going to get interesting. So the serpent, I said, had to make his move, right? He has to do something. He's going to, he's going to lose his planet. So the serpent, you notice he's a serpent in Genesis, and then you read Revelation, he's a dragon. Somebody's been feeding him. The serpent was the shrewdest. You notice it doesn't say he's the most powerful. He's the shrewdest of all the animals the Lord had made. One day, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees isn't it incredible how the devil comes to you and he talks to you about the I can't God instead of the I can God God doesn't say I can't he says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me see but he tells you you become a Christian you won't be able to do this you won't be able to do that you know what some of the things you're doing are hurting you that's why God is looking out for your best if you just listen he can change your life and flip you upside down sunny side up and you'll start feeling a lot better one day he asked the woman did God really say don't eat of any of these trees and you go, no of course we can eat the fruit from all the trees in the garden the woman replied it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat God said, don't eat it or even touch it or you'll die. You're going to spiritually die. And that means you, when you're separated from God, you're not going to, you don't have a life. You don't have a life. Go ahead. He said, you won't die. Now, you had, one thing is you're having a conversation with a snake. So what's wrong with you? Wake up. The snake replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God knowing both good and evil. This is what sin does. Sin tells you, no, you're going to feel better. It's going to feel good. It's not going to be nasty what you do as far as feeling bad sin. If sin always was bad, you know, and stuff like that, then nobody would do it. No, he's going to make it for a period of time. But then it turns on you. 
Verse 6, the woman was convinced, so she saw that tree was beautiful and, and it was the fruit, so it looks good. Sin looks appealing. It draws you. It looks delicious. And she wanted wisdom. I don't know where she got that from, that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit. She ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and they both ate it. And at that moment, look, at that moment, sin doesn't take long. It's only at that moment. You see, at that moment. It's not going to happen to you next week. At that moment, their eyes are open. They suddenly felt shame. Did something wrong. There's something in us when we do something wrong, we feel we did something wrong. But what happens, why do you keep doing it? You keep doing it, and then that feeling leaves after a period of time. But initially, when you do that first sin, you feel something. You wonder if you should do that. And then they cover themselves. First conversation with a human being, the devil wants to talk about God. And that's something. Not how's the weather, how's, how's the marriage going, how's it going out there. No, we're going to talk about God. And in one obedient second, they disobeyed God, handed to human grace, gave creation over to the evil one. Now, follow this. God is mad. Satan did this in heaven, twisted the ears of a third of the angels to his side. Now, he destroys and brings disobedience to his creation. So God has some choice words for the devil. And here's his words. This is one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. God then says to the serpent, because you did this, you're cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field, and on your belly you shall go, which signifies that the snake could stand and if you look at some old fossils, they will show fossils where snakes had legs in that day. Apparently was standing. And he says, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I'm going to put, now this scripture here is a key one. I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, that's Mary. He shall destroy your head, your mind your thinking, your plans, and you're just going to hurt his foot. That's talking about the cross, okay? You're going to hurt him in the garden. You're going to hurt him in the skirt. You're going to hurt him in that. But he's going to utterly destroy and humiliate you. And I'm going to give everyone that follows me the same ability to do what I can do. You can humiliate the devil if you realize what he's able to do. Satan is basically saying, God is basically saying to Satan, it's not, it's, not, it's not over, buddy. The battle is just on. You, you use the tree to bring down my creation. Guess what? I'm going to have a tree. And I'm going to hang a savior and a conqueror on it that's going to save mankind on a tree. And I can hear Satan Look at God, angry, cursing at God. On your belly you shall go. Who is going to make me eat dust? Who's going to do that? I can hear Satan. Who's going to make me crawl? Who's going to make me tap out? God says, I'm going to send a perfect champion. I'm going to send a conqueror. And he, you're not going to make him disobey. You're not going to turn him away from me. And Satan begins to look now. So now we're in the Old Testament. God says this in the Old Testament. So now Satan says, God is sending a man that's going to take you down. He's going to embarrass you. He's going to humiliate you. So we go through the Old Testament. That's what the Old Testament is. Abraham, one of the first greats. Is he the one? Is he the one that's spotless? Is he the one that's going to be the champion? Is he the one that's going to be sinless? Is he the greatest man of faith? Abraham. But no, he lies. He lies to an Egyptian about his wife. So he's a liar. He's not perfect. He's not spotless. In hell, as Lucifer, Satan is a songwriter and begins to write a song to go and shove it in God's face. And he writes this. Moses comes on the scene. Oh, Moses is the greatest pastor, the greatest deliverer of God's people. He's got to be the one. No, he gets angry one day. 
and he murders someone he can't be the one and hell begins to chant the song again well if it's not them we go through the Old Testament and Satan is looking for who's his champion Samson comes oh, he's got to be the one that's the greatest strength of anyone in history kills thousands of people by himself God's terminator but Satan found out he was a he-man with a she weakness and hell begins to sing another one bites the dust to shove it in God's face and then David comes is he the one the greatest worshiper there is in the Bible but he could kill his giants but he couldn't kill his lust and another one bites the dust then we have Solomon the wisest man who ever lived he wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. But he backslid away from God. And they begin chanting again their favorite theme song of another one, Bites the Dust. God, do you have anybody? But Elijah comes. Is he the one? Here is now one of the greatest prophets and powers of anyone in history. He takes 400 prophets of Baal and destroys them by himself. But a demon-possessed queen named Jezebel caused him to run in fear in the desert and in depression. And then another one bites the dust. Yeah. The Old Testament ends. Malachi's, you know. It ends, Old Testament. Satan has defeated every one of God's people, God's greats, God's heroes that we read about. We get to the end, and just for you to know, some of you, Bible-wise, from the last page of the Old Testament, and then when we turn to the New Testament in Matthew, that's 400 years past. So 400 years have gone by, and it's the Dark Ages. We don't know what happened during that time. So we don't know. And then the story picks up at the end of the 400 years, and Satan finds a man fasting in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. And his name, are you ready? His name is Jesus. I said his name is above all other names. There is no other name that's greater than the name. Demons tremble when they hear the name. The devil shakes in fear. Somebody shout the name of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how you like that, big boy? Jesus is fasting in the wilderness. Satan tempts him three times. Satan goes directly to tempt him. Jesus looks at him and quotes three scriptures to him. And it was a three-punch fight. He didn't get hit at all. Satan got hit three times. He goes, I think I'm going to go home. Satan goes back to hell. Then what happens Satan himself now is in hell and he starts seeing the demons start showing back up in hell because Jesus is pulling the stinger out of death is what he's doing Jesus is walking now and as he walks there's a mute spirit in an individual in the wilderness and he now is going to pray for that person with that mute spirit and all of a sudden the mute spirit of infirmity runs back to hell screaming there's a demoniac in Gadara that has a legion of demons 6,000 demons and Jesus looked at those demons and rebuked every one of them they said we don't want to go we want to go in pigs we don't want to go to hell going to pig all the pigs jump off a cliff they all kill themselves and that's where we got deviled ham from there's a younger generation has no idea what that tastes like <laughs> Jesus spits on the ground 
rubs it, puts mud in his eye. Go wash it off. He receives his sight. Hell's caution lights. Mom, 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 mom. They start flooding like this, going off. He's walking on water now, Satan. He's turning the water now into wine. He's feeding thousands of people, 20,000, with a few fish and bread. He's walking on water. Three times he praised death out of people. And the last one was Lazarus. What do we do with this guy? Watch this. Watch this. Stinger's being pulled out of death. Yeah. Death limps back. The last one out of last limps back to hell. Sickness is limped back to hell. All of them are injured. All of them in pain. Say, you got to do something. This one here we can't handle. He's not like the other ones we dealt with. We need you to deal with this. Satan, as prideful as he is, said, let's have a principality power meeting, board meeting. Um, tell me about this guy, Jesus. They start telling him. All of a sudden, everybody's telling him all the pain, all the issues in life. Satan then has a plan. He goes, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, everybody, all you demons, get all the demons back home. Pull them all in. Put them in the arena of hell. I'm going to have a surprise party tomorrow night. I have a surprise party. Let me take care of some things. And you wait. I'm going to take him down like I took down all those other prophets of God. He's going to fall. And what happens is they dismiss. And all of a sudden, camera. Satan comes up. He gets his cameraman from hell. He goes, okay. He's not really a demon. Don't, don't think that. Video, video. He's in the garden. So we're going to catch Jesus now in the garden. Here he is being arrested. How humiliating that is for the most powerful person in the world. And he got two Roman soldiers that's bringing him and arresting him. But as we know, in the garden, he prayed the prayer for you and I that made the greatest decision ever where he said, it's not my will. It's yours. So I'll do it. So he went where he could have destroyed, of course, the soldiers, but he didn't. As he's going, soldiers notice his disciple Peter. Get this over here, a video of this. We're going to show this tomorrow night. They're going to go crazy in hell. He is his main disciple. Foot-shaped foot, foot mouth Peter. Always stuck his foot in his mouth. He's here, and the soldier goes, You're one of his disciples. No! Yeah, you are. I don't know who you're talking about. Peter, having a fireside chat with compromise. Get a picture of him. That's good. Hey, we're going to catch him. We're going to beat him. We're going to beat him. We're going to beat him. Here's a scourging post. This was a scourging post, what it looked like. They would have ropes where your hands went just like this. And then you had to break your knees where you just hung. Now you see how my back is open to a whip and it would do the most damage Jesus Jesus was there and they'd take a person and in the whip here they'd have metal because Satan now wants to hurt Jesus Satan wants to disfigure Jesus Satan wants to go and be a hero here so he's going to do as much damage as he can glass is in this and then they have a soldier that would take go this way and go across his back like this as much as he could and then he'd switch he'd switch to this side and every time they'd hit it would catch his flesh and it'd jerk his flesh out of his back get a picture of that show a picture of what he looks like here ah get a crown get a crown what does a crown represent well they're just trying to be ugly no no it's more than that what happened when Adam and Eve sinned what happened to the ground what began to grow thorns and thistles began to grow crown of thorns they began to grow because there's a curse Jesus says 
You don't know it, but I'm taking the curse with me. Go ahead, put it on. I'm taking it to the cross. This is why he had a crown of thorns. So we have, you got this? You get a picture of him beaten? Now put him on the cross. Put him on the cross here. Put him on the cross. Yeah, yeah. We're going to nail his hands. Nail his hands. There. Nail this one here. Get his feet. Get his face. Look at pain. The pain. He's suffering. Now Jesus, as you know, had the power to wither the hand of a soldier. He said, I'm doing it for you. Because the devil doesn't think anybody can beat him. But see, when you talk about Jesus, you're talking about the one and the only one that did beat him. And Jesus is on the cross suffering for you and I. Get it, get his face. Get get yeah. Look at the pain. He's hurting. He's ripped. They gave him 39 stripes. They say at that time there were 39 known diseases of that day when Jesus was walking the earth. Catch him, catch him here. Yeah, yeah, he's getting ready to die. He's gonna die. What are you saying? Say it louder. It what? Is finished. He's dead. Rap, let's go. Go to the arena. Go, go. And what happens now? They're piling in. They're piling into the uh, the auditorium in hell. As they're piling into the auditorium in hell, everybody is just kind of chatting, just like you would see in an auditorium and so forth. And the devil's getting ready to speak and speak to those. All the demons, all the ones that were injured. He is standing as a hero. He killed the Son of God. So you can imagine how prideful he is as he's standing there with accolades of all the demons and all the principalities and powers. And so as he's addressing them, they put on the screen, they start showing the video. This is Jesus in the garden, helpless, gets arrested. Look at him here. Look at him here. Look at Peter, his disciple. Look at the scourging post. Scourging posts, yeah. Demons are screaming. They're going crazy. And all of a sudden, there's a man that begins walking in a robe in the back of hell in that auditorium. Every demon sitting out in the arena can see it looks like Jesus. Except Satan couldn't see because he's looking toward the crowd. Jesus is walking into hell. Didn't I tell you he went to hell for three days and three nights? This is what he did. He went to hell. He's walking up into his big arena with every demon there is in hell. Satan doesn't know why it got so quiet. And all of a sudden, Jesus grabs him by the back of his neck. Totally as quiet in that place. Jesus says, I understand you're having a surprise party. Surprise! I'm back! You didn't hear what I said! I said it is finished! Not that I am finished! I'm not finished! Now what? Watch this, watch this. When you conquered a kingdom in those days the king would be in his palace they wear crowns so what would happen is is you would go in to conquer a certain area find the king and the way you would show they that kingdom that they reigned that they were defeated was I would take the crown put it on my head of the king defeated I would get in a chariot and I would drag the defeated king around and I would let them know there's a new king there's a new boss and so can you imagine and even try to imagine for three days and three nights Jesus put a warning on every demon of hell that you know what devil doesn't tell you what to do anymore when I say jump you jump you understand is this who you're following and he's dragging the devil by the hair all around hell somebody needs to get excited about this you have the victory. He's more than a conqueror. Yeah! Yeah!
Stand up, stand up, stand up. Jesus says, yeah. Three days, three nights, he's there. This is what he came to get. I got keys. I got death. Some of you may be new here. I'll just, let me just... You maybe don't realize that I died four years ago. Four years ago I died. I just found this week, I didn't have this, I just found it. The clothes I wore Monday night that they cut off of me. You know how when you're on the ground they got to cut your clothes off. I guess they thought I was going to die, I need to find the guy that did this to buy me some clothes. He owes me. It's my death clothes. It's what I look like in the hospital when I was dead. I had a cardiac arrest right outside the door, right on the parking lot. For those of you that are new to our church, and God, thank God that He did. He had a key for me. He has a key for your family. He has a key for your life. He has a key for your body. He has a key for your future. He has a key for your family. All these keys, death, hell and the grave, they unlock. The devil had the keys. But not anymore. Jesus went to hell to say, you have absolutely no power over my people ever again. Ever again. How many are excited about that? So that's what he did. And even me knowing what I just told you, Every time I say it, it changes heart. It changes me. He loved me, and I didn't love him that much to follow him back in the day. But he did that when he, when I was a sinner, he did that. Some of you are struggling. Nobody loves me. You're wrong. You're wrong. Yeah. He loved you so much where he took your place on the cross. He died for you. Why would you not want to live for him? I feel like I owe God. I got to give him something back. If he created me, creation is not to go ahead and to eat of the knowledge of good and evil with an opinion. It's to follow the one that died for me, shed his blood for me. The devil's convinced some of you that you can't change. He's convinced some of you that you'll always be the way you are. Let me just tell you another attribute of the devil. He's a liar. Matter of fact, it says he's a daddy of lies. He's the father of lies. So if you lie, guess where that comes from? You have pride, guess where that comes from? You have fear, guess where that comes from? Because none of that's in heaven and none of that's from God. Today is your day. Easter Sunday. 2024 say I've done enough foolishness I realize I'm not going anywhere I realize my life is pretty much as boring as it gets I really don't even have a future I don't even have a I'm not even dreaming about something because I'm just looking at trying to make it through the day that's not the way God says you're to live do you understand you're living below and the devil is never going to let you come up out of that situation, no matter how hard you try. You have to surrender. You say, well, Pastor Glenn, I'm doing drugs, and I like getting high. Well, I've got the answer for you. You need to accept Jesus, because he's the most high. You can't get any higher than him. You want to get high? 
Kid Jesus. Bow your heads, bow your heads. All of you bow your heads. The lights come up a little bit. All over the building, this is my greatest joy that I'm about to do right now. And I'd be so honored. I've seen hundreds of people the last two services. So in the balcony, and also, and I welcome those of you over out in the lobby and also the chapel. There's going to be hundreds of people come down, so just make the decision. I'm not preaching just to give you a story. You know what? My heart goes out to you because I remember who I was saved. And I didn't want anybody to talk to me. Then you know what? I had a, I had a, I had a dream, and I never dreamed the night before I got saved that I got killed in a car wreck going down to like a spring break and I ended up going to hell and I woke up and said there is a hell and I'm going there it's not a party place my job is to go ahead and just represent who he was I'm just a representative of him I'm not him I can't save you but boy I could be a mouthpiece for what he's done in my own life there's no way I can tell you something if I haven't experienced it myself. I'm not here to make up a story. I'm not here to go ahead and try to try to deceive somebody or whatever. That's the devil does loves to do that. I'm here to be your friend and introduce you to one of the best lives you can ever live. And to ask Jesus to forgive you. You say, Well, I haven't done a whole lot. Yeah, you've done enough. Everybody, you're born a sinner. We're born that way. And we need a savior to bring us out so all over the building I'm going to count to three I want you to lift your hands and Pastor Glenn I would love to pray a prayer and I want to get right with God is what I want to do some of you might start lifting your hands right now you already know it's you and you're going to do that so just start doing it one say Pastor I Pastor Glenn I, I saw what Jesus did why do I want to live for the devil who is trying to destroy me keep me back keep me miserable Keep me in bondage. Keep me hurting. I'm choosing to get out today. Two, start lifting your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. Start lifting them all over in the balcony, in the other buildings here. Listen to me. You want to hesitate. I'm going to tell you why you're hesitating when you know you need to. You're listening to the wrong tree talking to you now. The other tree tells you you can't change. You'll never change. I'm telling you, as a person that has walked through it, you will change and God will change you I guarantee I don't I don't I don't I guarantee a hundred percent he'll do that three lift your hands lift all over the building say that's me all of you that are lifting your hands my greatest joy is to meet you right here at this altar I want you to come from the balcony come stand right down here at the altar we're gonna pray I want you to give them a hand come on you come to the altar come to the altar come on come if you came, if you're over here from the, from the, if you're out in the lobby, come, come out of the lobby, come from the prayer chapel, come on down, come on, come. If you came with somebody, come on, bring them down. This would be the greatest thing you could ever do, is to bring your friend to Jesus. Bring them. I'm not going to pull on you. I'm not going to make you. Because re remember what I said? It's your choice. Now I want you to think with me, because there's more people that need to come. You make this choice. Let me say it this way. We preachers will say, God's not guarantee you another day to live. Remember we say, you make your decision now. Tomorrow is the devil's favorite word. Everybody look here. Did, did they put the picture up there? Yeah, they showed that with a husband. I preached on Sunday. That was a Monday. I preach on Sunday. I'm running around the stage. I'm fine. And all of a sudden on Monday, I'm dead. I think today, more than any other time, our world is so unsteady. You can go to a mall and get shot. You can just go walk down the street. Somebody can break in. You don't realize that you don't have maybe another opportunity than right now. I would love to stop, but God say, please don't stop because there's a few more that are in, they call it the valley of decision. You're going to let the devil win or are you going to let God win down here? So I want to give you one last opportunity, give you about 10 seconds to come down. If you're scared to come down, stay in your seat. Because God says, I don't need cowards on my team. I need some people that's going to stand up. 
you got people standing up in every aspect of this world bragging about their lifestyles bragging about their 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 genders and we're in a church here and we have wonder about going down to an altar get out of your seat get a backbone and saying i'm going with god i'm not going to stay where i'm at give them a hand and coming down now come on if you come from the other areas come 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 on come over here god bless you if you came with somebody bring them god bless you sir god bless you sir good come on down come god bless you god bless you i'm not gonna beg anybody to come you come hey this is the greatest greatest thing you can have i don't i don't need to beg you you don't want this it's your choice it's a choice you get a choice you will live by your choices and their consequences of choices as you know we know that you got a choice i'm giving you a choice for your life to change what a wonderful wonderful deal that is to have abundant life and have the joy replace that depression and fear I know I'm talking to somebody I can't make you do anything it's your choice every man and every woman has a choice but this may be the last I don't know so this is your last opportunity and I would come down as quickly as you can and I'm going to pray come on come on come on Come here, man. Come up here. Come on, red shirt. Come here. There's some more here. Hey, buddy. What's your name? Dominic. <sighs> Let me sit down here. What took you so long? Why did I have to work so hard to get you down here? What are you thinking about? What were you dealing with? You got a lot of things going on. You were in a valley of decision, and you, you were kind of choosing which, which way to go. Well, you've already tried the other way. <laughs> yeah, why don't you try God a little bit? Why don't you let Him do it? Okay? Now, your life's going to change, and what's going to happen, Dominic, you're going to one day going to share your testimony up here on how God changed you from the life you've been living. You know that? And then you're going to bring your family to Jesus, okay? You're going to do that, okay? You never know. You never know who comes down and what people come down. But listen, this is, this is an opportunity for you. I'm offering you a great opportunity. If you haven't come, hurry up and come. I'm getting ready to pray. And we're going to close the meeting. We're going to close the meeting. Anyone else? It's your time. Okay. You can still come as I'm talking. Let me just tell all of you here. All of you here that are standing here. After I came back to life, I was still in tremendous pain. Just a couple of y'all coming down? Boy, you, it took me a long time to get you going. Come on down, come on. Everybody take two steps forward. Can y'all step forward? I tell people a song, singing is fine, preaching is fine. This is church. This is what God's, this is what you're going to remember. Amen. Here's some more coming down. Look at that. I mean, have another hour. If we wait, we're going to have everybody down here. Yeah, I'm proud of you. What I want to tell you is this, that this helps me more than anything else of any medicine or anything that I have is to see that God is allowing me to introduce you to Christ and for your life to change. I'm telling I'm serious. Uh, I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to stand up in front of people and help people again. Part of me going into a hole and going to a hopeless place during that time, and I think some of you know what that is, to go to a dark place, you go to a hopeless place. I've been there. I can relate to you. I, it's because I didn't have the opportunity to see lives change. See, my, 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 uh, my job is to populate heaven and depopulate hell is what I'm going to do. And see, I realized, let me just let you in on something. To me, church is not for people that are scared of going to hell. Church is for people that's already been there. And we've already been there. And those of us that are up here, we're not like coming up, we're so clean, we're so great. We've been broken, man. Life has just beat us up. But if Jesus has the ability to take something broken and put it together again, I'm, I'm in. I need it. And that's what he's going to do today. You walked in a certain way. 
but you're going to walk out different. You're going to walk out different. Take your right hand, put it over your heart. Take your left hand, just reach up to heaven like this. And I do this every place, any place in the world where I'm at. And with this just symbolic of I need God to come down and change my heart. Because everything comes from your heart. And church, we're going to pray with our people and our friends down here. Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, this Easter Sunday, I'm making a decision. The best one I can make in life. What I saw today and what you did for me, I don't know how to thank you. Other than following you, I am a sinner. I've done some wrong things, bad things, but you're a forgiving God. And today I ask forgiveness. Take away all the pain of my past and never let my past dictate my future again. Today, my life starts new. Everything is new. Everything is washed away. So I accept the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Not only this day, but as long as I live in Jesus' name. And everybody gave Jesus a great praise. Come on, somebody. It's unbelievable. How you feeling? All right, church. Happy Easter. Have a great time with the family. You got an understanding of Easter now. Always hold on to that. God loves you. I love all of you that came forward. Come to this church. You're going to hear the word of God. You're going to grow. You really will. Get involved.